Uh, I have some slides, but I won't explain too much about it, but um, just due to, to lack of time. Um, but it shouldn't be too complicated. If you have questions afterwards, I'm happy to, to discuss with you. I think I'm, now I'm delighted to share a few, some of my considerations, especially on the relevance of the research um, into the history of reception of ancient Egypt. The next 60 minutes will be about the Warburg tradition, Egyptian mysteries and Freemasonry, and the question of why history affects us, especially through the history of reception. <coughs> what do we actually do when we examine the Nachleben of Egypt? As simple as the term may sound first, it becomes more complicated when we go into detail. The conference organizers have indicated this with the terms continuity, discontinuity, survival, rebirth. What does this mean? Were there disruptions or only transformations? Was Egypt dead at some point or what was that? Um, even the translation of the term Nachleben in Abi Warburg oscillates between afterlife and survival. The problem becomes clear when we see how Egyptology was, um, has disregarded the reception of ancient Egypt until recently. The self-image of Egyptology in the 19th century and also in the 20th century was characterized by an emphatic polemic against reception history. Positivism and historism were predominant. The illusion of possessing objective truths was important for the establishment of scientific Egyptology. Nevertheless, this was naive. We now know how much science and its interest in knowledge is shaped by extra scientific factors and that science itself has not and is not objective or value neutral. Important factors for Egyptology, for example, were also the search for the truth of the Bible as a stimulus for excavations, financial greed in exhibitions and the antiquity trade or the cultural imperialism in the first major publication projects. And finally, post-structuralism, post-colonialism and gender studies have taught us that we are not unbiased in our thinking and in our research. Already the question of what extent we form a concept of history or to what extent history has formed us is not so simple. The interplay of the imprint by history that then becomes the object of interest was described by Hans-Georg Gadamer with the term Wirkungsgeschichte or history of effect. In the 21st century, the Berlin research group Transformations of Antiquity described it with the term Allelopoiesis. No matter how it is labeled, we cannot have an objective image of antiquity or ancient Egypt, and we are subject to an interaction of imprinted by the past and conceptualization of the past. We cannot escape this relationship, but we can critically question it and prove our point of view as scholars. So I start with the history of the question we are facing at this meeting. Secondly, I will outline with the mysteries of the Egyptians, something that has um, been both the object of reception and the epistemological framework for reception. And finally, I want to show how this Ideenfahrzeug to allude to a famous concept by Abbe Warburg is expressed in Freemasonry beyond disciplinary boundaries. The first academically outstanding studies on the history of reception of ancient Egypt are not explicitly devoted to this topic, but are rather two books dedicated to the history of art and book culture in early modern period. Karl Gilo had presented research on Dürer in 1904 and 05, especially on Melancholia I and on the Ark of Maximilian I. Gilo's studies caused a sensation in academia and he wanted to turn both into books, but he did not manage to do so during lifetime. This was done by others. The study on the Ark of Maximilian I was edited by Apat Weichselgärtner from Gilo's late writings, 
and intentionally published as a fragment in 1915. It was more tricky with the study on Melancholia I. Gilo was not satisfied with the final interpretation and more and more emerging material made publication difficult. After Gilo's death, Abby Warburg was supposed to continue this work, but was unable to do so. As such, Panofsky and Sachsel assumed responsibility for it. In the process, taking it much further and publishing the book with the title Dürer's Melancholia I, eine Quellen- und Typengeschichtliche Untersuchung under their own names in 1923 as volumes two of the Studien der Bibliothek Warburg. However, it is important to note that a shift in content took place that is crucial for our topic. In the preface to Panofsky's and Sachsel's book, Weichselgärtner emphasizes that Gilo, I quote, had discovered the main source for the symboli symbolism of the Ark of Maximilian I in the Hieroglyphica of Four Apollo, translated by Purkheimer and illustrated by Dürer. The assumption that Dürer's enigmatic engraving, Melancholia I, was connected with the revival of Egyptian antiquity and in particular its hieroglyphic writings was obvious." End of quote. According to Weichselgärtner, Gilo saw the philosophical framework in Ficino's writings. While Ficino is omnipresent in the study by Panofsky and Sachsel, Egypt and Hoa Pollon only appear en passant. As you all know, the monumental study on Saturn and melancholy emerged from this basis with the collaboration um, of Raymond Klibanski. But even here, the afterlife of Egypt hardly played a role. In fact, an opportunity for the research into the reception of ancient Egypt was missed. It is certainly one reason why the reception of ancient Egypt was addressed so late in a philosophically sound way. The afterlife of antiquity in the Warburg circle was not complemented by the afterlife of Egypt. In the same year that Panofsky and Sachsel's book came out, Ludwig Volkmann also published a book that followed Gilo, this time Gilo's book on Dürer's Ark of Maximilian I. However, in this text, he turns his attention less to Dürer and more to Francesco Colonna's Hypnotomachia Polyphony. Volkmann's book was published to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Champollion's decipherment of the hieroglyphs. Volkmann himself could not write anything sound about Champollion's achievement and its significance for the emergence of Egyptology, and he frequently confesses his ignorance. Nevertheless, this focus on the translation of the hieroglyphs was important, more clearly than Gilo. Volkmann placed the focus on the hieroglyphs and quite in the spirit of Gilo on the afterlife of ancient Egypt. The books by Gilo and Volkmann were then taken up in 1961 by the Danish Egyptologist Eric Iversen in his book, The Myth of Egypt and its Hieroglyphs in European Tradition. However, Iversen's book was no longer about the Renaissance and its art, but rather about the long tradition of understanding hieroglyphs. By the way, it's interesting to note here that the manuscript was revised by Erwin Panofsky. This book is a beginning of monographs that explicitly deal with the afterlife of ancient Egypt. Let me just mention Siegfried Morens and Juris Baltrosaitis. Iversen, Morris, and Baltrosaitis went on to have a decisive influence on the study of the reception of Egypt in the following decades. In the second half of the 20th century, research often had a tasteful tone was only of limited scientific value centered around the keyword of Egyptomania, even when there are brilliant studies using this keyword. Um, I and some of my colleagues are not very happy with this concept. The detailed study dominated the discourse until the end of the 20th century and the cultural philosophical framing of the topic in the sense of the Warburg School only occurred around the turn of the millennium. 
At the same time, many excellent studies have been produced which refer to other research discourses, history of art, history of literature, archeology, span and so on. In the year 2000, the conference took place here in London entitled Encounters with Ancient Egypt that highlights the achievements as well as the central problem. The resulting aged eight volumes published in 2003 are a stunning collection of articles and topics. They offer good insight into the variety of research, but do not present an, a coherent overview. Since overviews have been omitted, the detailed studies, some of which are, or many of which are brilliant, often stands isolated side by side. So sorry, um, uh, you already heard about it, but I have to mention it. Around the turn of the millennium, shift in the research landscape took place and the scientific value of the history of reception of ancient Egypt was redefined. By now, it was no longer regarded as a deficient prefiguration of Egyptology as Morens has done, no longer set in opposition to scientific logos using the keyword Egyptomania, Baltrusitis used this term, or like Folkman and Iversen, focused on the hieroglyphs um, as a supposed light motif. <coughs> Jan Astman's concept of memo history broke with this and postulated a completely new focus. Asman distinguishes between remembered history or memo history and research history. Memo history is not about measuring the concept of Egypt against the historical realities of pharaonic Egypt, as has been done, at least in undertones. For example, Morenz praises Athanasius Kircher for his Coptic studies, but he ridicules his understanding of the hieroglyphs. Rather, it asks what function the reference to Egypt has had in the various discourses and in the historical tradition. This means to understand what Kircher actually intended. And this, that drew the intention to questions about religion, philosophy, and so on, and not just the prehistory of Egyptology. Um, Asman's memory history is largely based on Abbe Warburg's cultural philosophy, but this would be going on another tangent, and so I will leave it um, to the side for now. Like many of us, I work with these approaches, especially since I'm a student of Jan Asman and still work together with him. A good four years ago, Bill mentions this, I organized a conference here at the Warburg Institute that was dedicated to the question of the connection between afterlife in the sense of Warburg, uh, uh, Warburg and memo history in the sense of Asman. Um, by the way, the papers are all published in the journal that was mentioned before, and I'm very happy if you are, want to submit papers, um, please do. I'm looking forward to all of your papers. Um, it's now great that this conference now further established this topic at the Warburg Institute, exactly where it belongs to. Um, now that we have looked at the history of research, I would like to show how, despite the missed opportunities, the Warburg tradition can nevertheless be effective for analyzing the reception of Egypt. To do so, I will take up an idea from one of the most interesting figures of the Warburg circle, Edgar Wind. Wind's book, Pagan Mysteries in the Renaissance, not only outlined, and, uh, outlines ideas, motifs, and top oil, it not only traces historical semantics with the mysteries, but it unfolds an epistemological model. Along with the mysteries as a motif, goes in hermeneutics that he traces through Renaissance art history. Let's begin with Plato and what he has to say about Egypt. In Plato's Phaedros, Socrates reports what he has heard from the ancients about the Egyptian toit. He was an inventor of mathematics, astronomy, and the alphabetic writing. Toit praised his inventions of writing as an object of learning that will make the Egyptians wiser and improve their memory. 
King Thomas, however, disagrees. Letter writing, and we are clearly talking about phonetic writing here, not pictorial or symbolic writing, would only promote superficial knowledge, not true and living knowledge, because true knowledge is an activity of the soul and cannot be objectified in external letters. The second significant um, reference is found in Plato's Timaeus. In the preface, which Plato puts into the mouth of Critias and which deals with the Atlantis legend, Egypt is described as the best real ap approximation to the long vanished ideal state of ancient essence. In Egypt, as in ancient essence, life was arranged according to the order of the cosmos. For Plato, Egypt forms a link between the ideal state in, the, in ancient essence and the Greek present. It testifies to the fact that Plato's idea of the state is possible and can become real. That is that it is well organized when it is regulated according to the model of the macrocosmos. Since the law of the cosmos do not change, social life is also ordered by law in the long term according to the principles of reason. This idea you can also find um, um, in the normal. For Plato, Egypt stands for continuity and immutability. In connection with the criticism of the writing in the middle um, dialogue Phaedros, Plato sees this as a weakness in the invention of Toit and a justified criticism by King Thomas. In the later works, Timaeus and Nomoi, this Egypt of duration and immutability is for Plato the best realization of the ideal. In the history of reception of ancient Egypt, however, these statements by Plato were contradicted by the philo philosophy of Platonism itself, which led to the survival of a completely different conception of Egypt. Egypt was understood here less as a land of eternal duration and objective knowledge in alphabetic writing than a vivification of Platonic philosophy in mysteries, symbols, and hieroglyphs. This story begins with Aristophanes. Sorry, I think Anna, oh, no, this is the right slide. Um, in the clouds, he criticized and mocked Socrates as a sophist and ridiculed his philosophy as a pompous mystery cult. For Aristophanes, the Socratic dialectic is not philosophy, but rather religious fraud. Plato and Aristophanes agreed in their rejection of Sophism, but not in their valuation of Socrates. Plato is defending Socrates by analyzing the language of the mysteries, and this brings us where Edgar Wind begins his book. Plato speaks of the mysteries with mockery and, in the second book of the Politeia, criticizes the notion of the forgiveness of sins by the mysteries. Nevertheless, Plato appreciates the purpose of the mysteries the liberation from the bodily instincts on the way to pure knowledge would structurally correspond to the mysteries in which only the purified myths could approach the gods. In Plato's understanding, a true initiation is not a ritual act, but a dialectic and lifelong process of searching for truth. The human being who is a soul in the platonic sense and possesses a body without being essentially a body must also carry out the initiation as an activity of the soul and not primarily of the body. Plato therefore does not deny that Socrates uses the language of the mysteries. However, the goal of these philosophical mysteries was not fraud and sophism, but rather a rational transformation of external cult mysteries into an inner spiritual process and comprehension. Most famous is Plato's use of the mystery language in the Diotima discourse in the Symposium. Plato did not yet connect the idea of philosophical mysteries with Egypt. This only happened in Middle Platonism, especially in Plutarch and Apuleius. By the way, as brilliant as Wind describes the language of the mysteries and poetic philosophy, Unfortunately, he did not draw the line further to the concept of Egypt, but that fits to this point that the Warburg school was not interested in ancient Egypt. So, sorry, 
a lot of text, but that's the only slide with, with uh, so many, with, with such a lot of text. In his treaty on Iris and Osiris, Plutarch recounts the myths of Osiris and offers several, not one, option for interpretation. This served the purpose of documenting the myths less than it did to establish a rational theology in the spirit of Platonic philosophy. According to Plutarch, philosophy as well as religion is about the knowledge of truth, and thus Plutarch presents rationalizing interpretations of the Osiris myth. Following his premise that religion is rational, uh, is rational search for truth, Plutarch assumes that the Egyptian religion is fundamentally rational. Everything could be logically understood by man. All that was needed was the appropriate hermeneutic. Egyptian wisdom, according to Plutarch, is not transmitted directly in plain language. Rather, it is hidden and wheeled, hinting or alluding to the truth and only allowing it to appear as a broken image. Egyptian religion and philosophy must therefore not be understood literally. I quote, whenever you hear the traditional tales which the Egyptians tell about the gods, their wanderings, dismemberments, and many experiences of this sort, you must remember what has been already said. And you must not think that any of these tales actually happened in the manner in which they are related. End of quote. Plutarch gives many examples also of the fact that one must not uh, by no means understand certain ideas of Egyptian religion literally, but must seek in them a rationality that is as convincing as possible. Plutarch explains how this should be done with um, reference to Plato's language of mysteries. I quote again. Wherefore, in the study of these matters, it is especially necessary that we adopt as our guide in these mysteries, the reasoning that comes from philosophy and consider referently each one of these things that are said and done. Mystery, myth and symbol can be made rational by the logos, but they can never be fully translated into logos. This is especially true for the supreme transcendent truth. And this is the reason why Plutarch gives many interpretations of Osiris myths, not only one. And I quote again, but the perception of the conceptual, the pure and the simple shining through the soul like a flash of lightning affords an opportunity to touch and see it but once. For this reason, Plato and Aristotle call this part of philosophy the epoptic or mystic part in as much as those who have passed beyond these conjectural and confused matters of all sort by means of reason, proceed by leaps and bounds to, the, to that primary, simple and immaterial principle. And when they have somehow attained contact with the pure truth abiding about it, they think that they have the whole of philosophy completely as it were within their grasp. End of quote. The supreme truths and the supreme deities are not directly displayable and perceptible in language. For Plutarch, Egyptian philosophy is a constant challenge to interpretation and rationalization with a vanishing point that can itself not be objectified. In this way, Plutarch articulated a methodological postulate for approaching Egyptian culture that was widely accepted until the 19th century and is still relevant, at least in non-scientific circles today. It is not the evident, not the first glance, nor the surface that is the essence of Egyptian culture. Interpretation is needed to truly understand Egypt. There are two levels, that of appearance and that of essence. Another middle Platonic philosopher and author, Apuleius, has not been important in the history of reception, um, uh, has, has been important in the history of reception less because of his philosophical writings than because of a fabula that was read at both poetry and fiction, uh, and nonfiction, sorry. 
Despite its largely fictional character, Apuleius shaped the understanding of the mysteries with the 11th book of his Metamorphoses and tied this conception closely to ancient Egypt and the goddess Isis. The climax of the account of the mysteries is the ritual death through, through which the old physically driven human being dies and the new spiritual guided human being arises. What the narrator experiences is not allowed to be made public by Apuleius according to the Disciplina Arcanum. Nevertheless, he describes the last crucial step of initiation in, in enigmatic language. I quote, I came to the boundary of death and having uh, trodden on the threshold of Proserpina, I traveled through all the elements and returned. In the middle of the night, I saw the sun flashing with bright light. I came face to face with the gods below and the gods above and paid reverence to them from close at hand." End of quote. These are figures of speech that refer to their symbolic character, the life in the underworld, the sun in the night, the face of gods below and above. But this artificial language is a way of talking about the mysteries and at the same time obeying the Disciplina Arcanum. Apuleius here emphasizes the inadequacy of human language for the divine in order to then use precisely this language to poetically encircle the object that is actually taboo. So that's something I will leave out. I just, sorry. Um, I think you can find similar ideas um, of omnipresence of the God of the evolution of space and time and something which you can call a panentheism in, in many sources. And I think it's a very important basis for the understanding of the history of reception of ancient Egypt. But due to lack of time, I leave out to tell you about the Corpus Hermeticum. And I go on with Neoplatonism. In addition, to these two middle Platonists, Neoplatonism had had a profound influence on the concept of Egypt in the West, especially a book by Jamblichos, which has been known since Marsilio Ficino's translation under the title De Mysteries Meteorum. This book is central for the understanding of Neoplatonic philosophy as Egyptian wisdom. It derives the doct doctrine of the absolute transcendence of the first principle from the Egyptians and identifies Egyptian theology and philosophy with Hermeticism. With the authority of the Egyptian priest Ab Amon, Jamblichos here instructs Porphyrios on controversial issues within the Neoplatonic school. In the history of reception, this position of Jamblichos could be understood as Egyptian theology thanks to the literary fiction of the text. Jamblichos fits into the history of the philosophical mysteries of the Egyptians, as in Apuleius' account of the mysteries of Isis, as in Plato's idea to Agatu, and as in Plutarch's understanding of the primordial god Amun. The perfection of Egyptian wisdom is the insight that the element, the transcendence, and at the same time grounds human reason cannot itself be a simple object of knowledge and reasoning. Even when Plato and his followers agree on this point, the consequences for the concept of Egypt are very different. With Plato, the idea to Agatu is not associated with Egypt. In Plutarch, it is about an uh, approach to truth in the work of rationalizing religion. In Apuleius, it is about a poetic theology of the unspeakable. In Jamblichos, on the other hand, men must trust in the revelation through the hermetic writings. In this respect, Plutarch, Apuleius, and Jamblichos represent three quite different ways of relating to Egypt, rational philosophy, poetry, and revelation. So, this platonic approach to hermeneutics seems to me to be evident at least in writings with philosophical implications. 
In the Quattrocento, it becomes obvious with the translation and commentaries of the Corpus Hermeticum or De Mysteries. It can be found in Paracelsism or even in the Eblemita literature described by Gilo and Volkmann. When Aristotle is cited as a witness to Egyptian wisdom, the exception confirms the rule. In 1519, a Latin text appears with spectacular title Sapientissimi Aristotelis Tagirite, Theologia Sive Mystica, Philosophia Secundum Agitius. However, these are excerpts taken from Plotinus Enneads. Um, Charles Burnett knows much more about uh, this text than I do. Um, Francesco Patrizzi included this text in his Nova de Universis Philosophia in 1591. Patrizzi assumes that Plato had been initiated into the mysteries in Egypt and read the Hermetic books. The Egyptian secret doctrine was, according to Patrizzi, the essence of Plato's own unwritten esoteric teachings. Aristotle then had put Plato's esoteric teachings into the present theology. In this way, Plotinus Neoplatonism could be received as Egyptian wisdom and at the same time was regarded as the esoteric teachings of Plato in an Aristotelian tradition. <laughs> With the mysteries of Egypt, we thus have a motif that at the same time transmits several variations of an epistemology for ancient Egypt, which can be applied to philosophy, literature, and religion, indeed, to all forms of culture. It said something I want to show you now with the Freemasons. So let's turn to Freemasons and their conception of ancient Egypt. Um, Freemasonry, uh, let's see an overview. Let's turn to this one here. Freemasonry in its present form is founded in London in 1717, although this cannot be supported by proper sourcing. Sourcing is maybe just a legend. The first constitutional book to which Freemasons refer to this day was published in London in 1723. Much of the symbols and myths of the Freemasons refer to the building of Solomon's Temple and the cathedral workshops or the craft guild of the Middle Ages. The building of Solomon's Temple is the main legend while the cathedral workshops of the Middle Ages are the historical background for the formation. Numerous internal workings of the Freemasons are subject to secrecy, but the existence of the lodges are not a secret. So it's, we, we, we call it a discrete society, not a secret society. Freemasonry can appear in very different forms depending on social, political, cultural, and historical conditions. However, the Freemasons are not completely diverse either. Freemasons are members of a mystery community centered on a secret as well as initiation rituals. But what the secret is has been a controversial among Freemasons themselves as the question who or who a true Freemason is. The dispute over precisely this question is what unites the Freemasons. And I believe they have some structures in common that arose from the concept of mysteries described above. Freemasons meet in non-public assemblies where they perform their rituals. The area of ritual, whether it is a purpose-built building or even a public pub, is called a temple. All actions from the op official opening to the closing of the temple are subject to a ritual order. All masons participating in the ritual wear ritual robes, have ritually defined roles, and move in a space that has symbolic value. To this day, the three degrees of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason are fundamental. Initiations into further degrees can follow in the so-called high degrees. The rituals are often followed by social events that are no longer part of the ritual itself, but are nevertheless subject to a regulated structure. In the beginning, in the beginnings which are still relevant, 
for many Freemasons today, only free men in free profession who acknowledged a transcendent monotheism were admitted. To this day, it's controversial whether women, non-believers in monotheism, or even people of color or queer people can become Masons. Symbols are very important in Freemasonry. The rough stone, for example, symbolizes man in all his weakness before he works on himself as a Freemason to become a building block in Salomon's temple. However, an explanation of the symbols does not actually explain Freemasonry. Most symbols can be understood in many ways, and it's precisely the ambiguity of the symbols that is constitutive. This all about working on the symbols and not possessing a final truth. The constant work on oneself is more important than a perfection that can never be achieved by humans anyway. Let me give you a quote out of a lodge that I will explain later on the African master builders. Um, we are going through the past time, what Egypt and Greece have produced in the way of art we still discover under the ruins of antiquity. But within ourselves, we are building the great temple of friendship that no time can destroy. We work in silence on our perfection and never think we shall be finished with it. For we know that nothing in the world is finished. As indicated by this quote, history plays a central role in Freemasonry. They invoke history again and again to understand what Freemasonry and their mysteries are. In the constitutions from 1723, one part is devoted to the rules and the second part to history. You have here the frontispiece and um, um, just to, to, to show you uh, Freemasons believe that Adam was the first Freemason. And so Freemasonry is an anthropological factor and not an historical one. And so, it's, this book is uh, printed in the year of masonry, 5723. Yes, it means with the beginning of the world. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and we have an extensive history of Freemasonry, and also there, Egypt plays a crucial role, not the most important, but a crucial one. Um, in fact, many lodges refer to ancient Egypt. Let me just briefly indicate this for the 18th century. Um, the Vienna Lodge zur Waren Eintracht had great influence on society. Certainly half of the Viennese upper class belonged to this lodge. They had a kind of research program on the mysteries of antiquity, where uh, Egypt was very important. Mozart heard a lecture, um, on the Egyptian mysteries in this lodge, which may have had a profound influence on the libretto of the magic flute. Jan Asraman attributes this lodge and its conception of Egypt to the Enlightenment, although there's a question, what do we understand by Enlightenment? That this is, in fact, um, enlightened absolutism, if we want to have it this way, and surely not radical Enlightenment Spinozism in the sense of Jonathan Israel. Yeah? Um, at the same time, there were the Golden Rosicrucians who fought against an Enlightenment deism and drew on the Paracelsism at the Rosicrucians of the late 16th and 17th century. In working on the Philosopher's Stone, they wanted to work on themselves as human beings and purify themselves at the same time. Egyptian Freemasonry is clearly counter-Enlightenment in this case. The most popular representation of Egyptian mysteries was known under the name of Count Cagliostro and alias for Giuseppe Balsamo, who was born in Palermo in 1743. Historical facts about Balsamo are rare and difficult to verify, as historical figure is overshadowed by self-dramatization, myths, and tales. Together with his wife, he sold alchemical elixirs and claimed to be able to predict lottery numbers by means of Kabbalah. Presumably, Cagliostro was admitted as a Freemason in 1777, 
He founded numerous Masonic lodges, which had oper to operate according to a so-called Egyptian read. He claimed that he had been initiated into the mysteries 1000 years ago in the Egyptian pyramids and had learned the secret of the philosopher's stone. There, uh, therefore, he lived forever in health and wealth and promised to pass on this secret in his Freemason, of course, for a lot of money. And of course, he didn't live forever in wealth uh, and health because he was arrested in 1789 um, and he died in 1795 uh, in prison. In literature, Cagliostro's Freemasonry became the incorporation of fraudential ostentation. And by the way, this, you can find these ones, this is this hieroglyphs um, um, uh, from which Cagliostro um, claimed that, that they um, um, unveil the secret of the Philosopher's Stone. And he found them in the Egyptian pyramids, as you can yeah, very interesting interpretation of hieroglyphs. Uh, but people believed him. That's what matters. Now let's turn our attention to the Order of the African Master Builders, founded in Berlin in 1764. The constitutional writing, Krata Repoa, or Initiation in the Ancient Secret Society of Egyptian Priests, was published in 1770 went through three editions until 1785, repeated in Russian in 1784, in French in 1821, and in English in 1882. This lot was highly regarded in esoteric and occult circles from the 19th century onwards. The first English tr translation of Krater Rupur was published by the occultist John Jarka in 1882 in the Knef, the official organ of the ancient and primitive writ of Misrael, uh, Memphis and Misrael. And Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the leading figure of the Theosophical Society, founded in the 1870s, paraphrased mm -hmm. Krater Poa in the second volume of Isis Unwield as an ideal description of ancient Egyptian mysteries. In the 20th century, Heinrich mm -hmm. Trenker, we had founded numerous theosophical and esoterical groups, reprinted Kata Repoa under the name Henkelkreuzmann. Henkelkreuz is the German word for the Egyptian Anch. Yeah. And Friedrich Wilhelm Quinscher tried to revive this African master builder lodge. And even in the 21st century, an Ordo Templi Astarte still works according to Kata Repoa and an occultist named Nick Farrell published a book in 2013 claiming to decode Krater Repoa. So let's go to Krater Repoa. Um, and to the content. Krater Repoa outlines an initiation in seven degrees. The description is backed up with numerous footnotes, which are supposed to document all details on the basis of text by ancient and also modern authors. It presents itself as a scientific reconstruction of an Egyptian ritual and has often been understood as such. At the same time, it is a kind of a script for the rituals of the lodge. Following the example of Pythagoras, the candidate travels from the temple of Heliopolis to Memphis and on to Thebes, is purified and must be fastening before he's led into the temple. His resistance is tested in the first degree in wind, rain, lightning, and thunder. He obeys the construct, con constitution of Krata Repoa, is warned against preconceptions, and told to contemplate the divine. Before, he's taught about the origin of the names of the gods. In the second degree, fasting and sexual abstinence are required. <clears throat> having also shown himself to be fearless against snakes, the candidate learns the mathematical sciences. Each degree is dedicated to different form of science. In the following degree, sorry. In the following degree, the candidate passes through the gate of death into the underworld and into a room in the middle of which stands the coffin of Osiris. 
the candidate is ritually killed and thus enters the fourth degree to be defeated in a battle of shadows by persons in horrible shape. He kills Gorgo, ritually kills Gorgo, and witnesses a performance in which Horus kills the Osiris murderer Typhon, whereby he receives instructions to chemistry. The following instructions on the origin of the whole doctrine of the gods and the art of the stars in the sixth degree is followed by a priestly dance depicting the course of the stars. Finally, the seventh degree, um, as the must receives the permission to read the secret books. This Egyptian ritual is a good example of synesthetic drama, the many illusions without clear answers. It fits perfectly into the mystery model described earlier. What this book is supposed to mean was very controversial in literature. Most of the interpretations had an occult background. The investigation into the history of reception of ancient Egypt and the model of the Egyptian mysteries, however, leads to completely different perspectives. To do this, we first have to broaden the perspective and focus on the mysteries in the Egypt, uh, of the Egyptians in literature and in a book on the history of religion. One of the problems dealing with Freemasonry texts is that many scholars try to explain just out of the tradition of Freemasonry. And the good thing about following the traces of ancient Egypt is that you cannot do this. Yes, you, you always have to regard other texts and other traditions, and that brings you to quite interesting results. Yeah, I try to show you. Um, in literature, the emotional potential of the mysteries are emphasis in particular. The best known and most influential was Zetos novel, uh, uh, was the Zetos novel by Terrasson. But in order not to bore you with the well known, I will give you another example. Charles de Fumouy's novel La Mekis was published in 1735. It was uh, translated um, uh, 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 four, uh, sorry, and was translated in very many languages. This is a collection of stories that are artfully interwoven and have various influences. Lucian's true story, the Voyage Imaginaire, the French fairy tales, and the tales of 1001 Nights. And they are also a fascinating collection of tales of Egyptian mysteries. Mui recounts an underground Egypt where the priests of the Rapis celebrate horrific mysteries. In the style of a Gothic novel, terrifying looking men frighten the protagonists and flames fed by human bones terrify them. The conflict between Egypt above ground and Egypt below leads to a war in the course of which the priests of the Rapis flee Egypt. In another narrative, the first person narrator, the Egyptian Lamekis, tells of a journey to the center of the earth, of a lake of flames, alchemical drinking gold, and the rituals of ugly war men. And finally, the reader learns of Egyptian mysteries in heaven, so terrible that the candidate ultimately refuses initiation. For Mui, the underworld is a space of horror and political danger. The Egyptian mysteries are fascination that is not only a promise of salvation, but also a source of pain and terror. Superficially, we are dealing with many established mystery topoi. The initiated lays down his old bodily self in order to emerge from the initiation as a purified and refined human being. And only now he or she realizes the real truth. However, the traditional metaphor of contempt for the body and readiness for death is taken seriously and unfolded in such excessive form that the mysteries now appear as an absurd martyrdom. Mui turns the contempt for the body and the torments of the death of the mysteries into an aesthetic and narrative principle. Horror seems to have taken on a life on its own and is no longer merely a way 
of making the beautiful and the good appear even more sublime. The locus horribilis is not followed by a locus amoenis, as it is usually done in aesthetics of classicism. Some of the rituals of initiation that Mui describes um, um, are reminders of those of the Freemasons. They are indications that he was familiar with Freemasonry and its rituals. The horror and shiver that Mui creates in literature is prefigured in their ritual threats of punishment. In an 18th century ritual, it says, Binding myself under no less penalty than that of having my body served in two, my bowls taken from sands and burned to ashes, the ashes scattered to the four winds of heaven, so that no more trace or remembrance may be had of so vile and perjured a wretch as I, should I ever knowingly or willingly violate this my solemn obligation as a master mason. And this text belongs obviously to the ritual of uh, becoming a master mason. These are punishments that, uh, uh, that these punishments were ever carried out can be ruled out. However, these oaths were one of the most important foundations for the rumors of cruel ritual murders, such as those surrounding Mozart's death, and which are still fascinate a wild public today in Dan Brown's novels or in conspiracy theories. Here, the mysteries of the Egyptians are read as shocking, and the, they pervert the ideas classically associated with the mysteries. This becomes particularly clear when we compare Lamekis with Terrasson's Zetos novel. The mysteries in Zetos actually serve a pedagogical purpose, leading Zetos to virtue and knowledge. Here, Two, the mysteries of Egypt are used to create an aesthetic of emotional shock and thus teach a lesson. The aesthetic means are the same as the use of traditional topoi of mysteries, but the purpose are completely different. In Mouy's book, Egyptian mysteries serve as a critique of religion. In Terrasson's book, they serve as a foundation of a society supported by religion. The aesthetics in literature have been taken up by the Freemasons in general and the African builders in particular. Krata Repor and Terra Sans Zetos were read as two parts of the same ancient Egyptian mystery. The drama and aesthetics of the rituals of the Egyptian Freemasonry owe much to fictional literature. From the perspective of the, and, and this is something that begins actually with Apuleius here, when you uh, consider that Apuleius was the most important source for the mysteries of the Egyptians, and Apuleius wrote a fabula. Yeah. From the perspective of the reception of ancient Egypt, there are fascinating interactions between literature and Masonic rituals. The Freemasons drew on literature for the dramatic composition of their rituals. And later, the Masonic rituals were in turn translated into literature with horror, eroticism, and sensual pleasure. So much for emotion and aesthetics. However, other texts lead us to the traces of philosophical and theological content. In the 18th century, discussion of ancient mysteries was in most cases also a discussion of pre-Christian religion. A good example is Plüsch's History of Heaven. In this book, Noel Antoine Plüsch derives ancient Egyptian religion from Noah and his offspring. Like many others before him, he identifies Noah's grandson Misraim with Menes, the legendary founder of Egypt. This Egyptian religion had initially been pure observation and worship of nature, which was recorded by hieroglyphs and myths and served to sustain and organize Egyptian society. Osiris was a symbol of the sun, Isis of the fertile harvest, and her son Horus of the work on nature. The Osiris myth was, according to Plüsch, to be understood as an account of the flood. For Plüsch, this religion was reasonable. While the development, uh, with the development of phonetic writing, the Egyptians had forgotten how to read their symbols 
and had fallen into superstition. They would have misunderstood the symbolic signs as literal. Osiris was therefore no longer the symbol of the sun, but was misunderstood as a god. The priests, as specialists in the observation of nature and hieroglyphs, would have had their symbol, symbolic knowledge of nature in the secrecy of the mysteries. Over time, however, even the priests would have forgotten the knowledge of the symbolic teachings. Plutus's reconstruction of Egyptian religion seemed to be largely consistent with an enlightenment deism, but far from it. Plutus wants to show the truth of the mosaic books and provide material for the proof of the true gospels. Only with Moses had there been a true revelation. Since Plutus devoted not even 50 of the almost 800 pages of the, to the mosaic genesis, but many hundreds of pages to the allegorical interpretation of ancient Egypt, it is hardly surprising that Plus's book could be read against the author's, author's intention. In 1783, Christian Ernst Wünsch presented a radical critique of religion in the sense of Hermann Samuel Reimarus in his book Horus, following Plus and called for a deistic re-reading of the Bible. Now we reach really Spinozistic radical enlightenment. Strangely, no one realized that Plus's book is so very important for Crater Report. The title is discussed here and traced back to Harpocrates. Many ritual names of the lodge of the African master builders come from this book. We now understand many details that are first strange, quite strange. For example, why astronomy as the observation of the stars considered fundamental, but astrology is rejected. So this background is important to understand how these Masons struggle to understand themselves in terms of philosophy and theology. In numerous writings, the members of the African builders repeatedly explain their lodge, but finally await defining its teachings. In 1791, uh, for example, an account was published of the ritual practice in the lodge, which the author claimed to have witnessed in 1768. According to this account, the lodge session was held in a temple in Egyptian style. The extent to which the ritual is indebted to Platonic philosophy becomes clear when we hear that the dark chamber into which the initiate um, was led for meditation was labeled as Plato's cave. In the entrance to the temple, um, there said to have been a black table with the following words, quote, he who walks this path alone without looking behind him shall be purified by fire, air and water. And where he can overcome the terror of death, he shall come forth again from the bottom of the earth and see the light, also have the right to prepare his soul for the greatest mysteries. This is a passage from Terra Sans Zetos, which was also included in the libretto of the magic flute. The motif of the passage through the elements as an overcoming of man's mortality, which is addressed here, has its origin in the all seeing in Apuleius, or as I wanted to show you in the Corpus Hermetic writings. <clears throat> in terms of the content of the mystery, we only learn that it was a lesson in astronomy derived from Noah and that Moses backwards cesium is a keyword. Something we clearly understand regarding Plush. Astronomy corresponds to the observation of the nature of the primordial <laughs> Egyptian religion and the biblical tradition remains the foundation of Jews. There are numerous other texts in which the members of the lodge are shown to be working on their self-understanding. For example, a detailed legend of origin. We read how Noah's son Ham went to Egypt after the end of the flood, cultivated the land and ruled it with wise laws, assisted by a commission of advisors called Krater Repoa. Under Hermes, this commission had become a secret and learned society into which many other wise men of the Greco-Roman world, for example, Pythagoras, were initiated. 
we are different religious and learned groups. The teachings of this, uh, of this school of wisdom reached the Knight Templars, were restituted in Italy in form of the Academia Romana and caused the sensation under the name of the Rosicrucians. Now the lodge has been set out to preserve the heritage of the Societas Alitophilorum. Numerous other names and teachings are mentioned, but there is no commitment to a dogmatic core. This eclecticism can be understood as meaningful against the background of the mystery model. All the teachings mentioned refer to a truth that can not in itself be articulated verbally without themselves these teachings being this truth. I could continue with many more fantastic texts and show you how this lodge was oriented towards the philosophy of Christian Wolf and the theology of the Latitudinarians. How they wanted to find a balance between reason and revelation by orienting themselves towards ancient Egypt and the tradition of the mysteries. Even the bizarre, most bizarre looking Masonic Lodge reveals exciting secrets when we follow the traces of the history of reception. Even though these secrets lead us again and again to new questions and mysteries. Just a few words to conclude. Egyptian mysteries have not only been an object of reception, but have carried an epistemology, a relationship between aesthetics and philosophy, an idea of learning by means of emotions and drama from antiquity to our own day. These mysteries were taken up again in the 19th century in horror and devotional literature and transformed into reading mysteries. Nowadays, this can be seen in Hollywood films and novels by Dan Brown, as well as in numerous conspiracy series that are currently threatening democracy. Anti-Masonry and anti-Semitism have had an unholy alliance since the 19th century, and the notion of the Egyptian mysteries is dangerously effective here, when the truth can be found lurking beneath the surface. It opens the door to conspiracy series and fake news. This in Egypt continues to have an effect and at the same time must be appropriated and adapted again and again. In the sense of Abbe Warburg's Nachleben, it is both here. Something comes from the past, something shapes us and can be uncanny as living dead. This haunting past, however, can also be mastered by means of productive appropriation. Working on history means liberation from the burdens of history. If we want, if we understand the history of these thought patterns, aesthetics and excitement mechanisms, we can open up a Denkraum der Besonnenheit to quote Abi Warburg again. To this day, the study of the history of reception of ancient Egypt contributes to our self-understanding and is neither escapism nor Egyptomania. Thanks a lot for your attention.